Hi guys, today we're going to answer some more of your questions, so let's get started. I assume that everyone knows what this question is all about, but just in case you're new here, back at the very first episode that we made, we ended with this clip. You can sit back, have a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend. And that sort of became the way we ended every episode of the old blue collar woodworking show we used to do. It became sort of a catchphrase. People bought t-shirts and coffee mugs and that sort of thing. Then sit back. Then you can sit back. Me, I'm gonna sit back. Have a cold one, and have a cold one. And have yourself a cold one. Be Sit back, and have a cold one. Have yourself a cold one. We can have a cold one because... Because you've earned it, my friend. Because you've earned it, my friend. Because I've earned it, my friend. Because you've earned it, my friend. Because you've earned it, my friend. These days, we still do say that at the end of every episode of these Behind the Sawdust vlogs. And occasionally, I get asked about where it comes from. Well, it just sort of came out when we were filming that first take. The phrase cold one is common in Northern Michigan and Canada, it usually refers to beer. Of course, we don't drink while we're woodworking or filming most of the time. So this is usually pop or soda, depending on where you live in the country. That's inside my Red Wings koozie. But I do enjoy a real cold one from time to time, and I like just about everything. My favorites are the abundant craft beers that are brewed here in Michigan, especially IPAs. But I'm not a beer snob. I like the mass-produced domestics occasionally too, except for light your beer, because I could pee in a can and drink it if I wanted to without having to pay for it. I also like good bourbon and scotch, and I learned to drink vodka in my time in Eastern Europe. Russians know their vodka. One of the perks of doing what I do is that sponsors sometimes send me expensive bottles, so I've been able to accumulate a nice collection of top shelf stuff and try some stuff that in the past I was never able to try before. But I'm a reasonably light drinker. I like to keep my head clear whether I'm woodworking or not. When you have a personality like mine, you don't want to alter it with too many cold ones and deprive the public of all this charm and wit. I think there's some pros and cons, just like with everything else. A big benefit, as far as a small shop is concerned, is that a two-in-one machine generally takes up less space. Their footprints are typically larger than a six-inch jointer would be, but you get the planer in there, too. And by sharing the same cutter head, you get to use the full 12-inch width for jointing as well as planing, which is huge. I would kill for the ability to be able to flatten 12-inch wide boards on my jointer. The problem is, while they've been pretty common in Europe for a while now, they're still hard to find here in the USA. There's only three or four companies that sell them here, and they don't make a lot of different models, and the reviews are sometimes iffy. I can't really then give you my opinion on a lot of the things, such as whether they're a hassle to switch back and forth between jointing and planing. That's definitely something you should consider. And I can't speak to any specific machines, but there are reviews online about most of them. So I'd point you to those. You do not want to buy a piece of equipment of any kind without reading as many reviews as you can. And be honest with yourself as you look at the reviews. You have to put aside your desire to own that particular piece of equipment, especially if it's in your price range, and consider if it's really right for you. As you read and watch reviews, try to pay close attention to the ones that are made by people who have actually used the tool for a while, rather than posting a review of their first impression, which is what a lot of people do. Everybody gets excited when they get a new tool, and they often leave a good review before they have a chance to take a more objective look over time as they use it. For example, the 10-inch benchtop joiner planer combo that Jet makes looks great. A lot of people are drawn to it because it's got a nice compact size and the price is pretty low as far as those machines go. But people who have used it for a while say they have all sorts of problems keeping it aligned because it's just a flimsy design. So the bottom line is, I would love to have a jointer planer combo machine, and I may get one eventually. They seem like a fantastic option for a non-production shop, but they are expensive and you should do your research well before buying one. I think this is a question a lot of new woodworkers wonder about when they see that fancy jointer in the store and among the features they see listed cuts rabbit joints. But don't be fooled. Yes, a stationary jointer can cut a rabbit, but should it? First of all, you have to remove the blade guard, which has been a pain in the butt on every jointer I've ever used. I know some people do like to cut rabbits on jointers, or at least they do it, and so they may totally disagree with me but I think it's little more than a gimmick. 
It's easier to use a router table or a table saw with a dado set to cut a rabbit where you have full support for the panel throughout the cut. Table saw fences are usually easier to adjust to fine tune the rabbit's fit than a jointer's fence as well. Some people say, well, maybe I don't have a router table or a dado set. Well, if you don't have a rubber router table or a dado set, you probably don't have a jointer either. And either way, you could double cut rabbits on the table saw with a regular rip blade instead of a dado set. In fact, we made a video all about sawing rabbits on the table saw. I'll put a link to it in the notes below this video. I almost always glue my woodworking joints, no matter what kind they are, unless I may want to take them apart later. But glue is especially important in certain types of joints. Generally speaking, it can, if it can be easily assembled, it can be easily disassembled. So you should glue it. Finger joints should always be glued. Dovetails should be glued, even though on drawer construction, they can't be pulled apart in the direction that a drawer is normally pulled, but they can still work themselves loose, especially after seasonal movement has had some time to work on them. A mortise and tenon joint should be glued unless you're going to use wedges or draw bore and pin it. In those cases, as long as you do it properly, those joints aren't coming apart no matter what. So it's up to you whether or not you want to use glue on them. Of course, there are some joints that shouldn't be glued, or at least not with standard yellow glue. Obviously, you wouldn't glue a joint that you may want to take apart later. For example, I use screws on certain parts of complex jigs that I may want to take apart and make changes to later or adjust. Another thing to consider is what type of glue to use. Chairs take a beating every time we set our big fat butts on them. They're eventually going to need repairs. So do a favor for the guy who may someday repair a chair that you made. Use hide glue. It's strong enough to last, but the joint can be heated and disassembled if and when repairs are needed. I would apply the same reasoning to stools and benches and other pieces of furniture like that. I don't think it's as important to use hide glue on casework, such as cabinets and chests of drawers and that sort of thing, because they usually sit still and so the joints don't get the same stresses. They're less likely to need to be disassembled later on. And the fact that hide glue has a short working time makes it difficult to use for dovetails and other joints that you're more likely to find in larger casework. Another time you may not want to use glue is if a joint is likely to squeeze the glue out when you assemble it and it will be too difficult to clean that squeeze out up later. But you better make sure that the joint will hold together on its own. Some people use tiny pin nails, for example, to attach fine moldings and then avoid squeeze out that would come if they used glue. But that's another place that you could use hide glue because hide glue is easier to scrape or sand away than PVA glues. We could talk about glues all day long, but we won't because that wraps up this edition of Behind the Sawdust. If you have any questions for next time, which we'll do about a month from now, we'll do another question and answer edition, leave them in the comments below, or contact us through our website, or leave it on Facebook or on Twitter. Don't forget to support our sponsors who made it possible for us to produce over 100 free woodworking videos for you in the past year. You can visit their websites at the links below the video here, and just look around and see what they have to offer. Next week, we'll do another Cool Tools edition of Behind the Sawdust, where you'll see some of the things that maybe you haven't seen in the past. You might find some surprises, so don't miss that. Oh, and don't miss our other woodworking videos that we'll be making between now and next week. In the meantime, be sure to visit StumpyNubs.com for the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal, which is always full of great tips, tricks, tutorials, and techniques to make you a better woodworker. You can read and subscribe for free at StumpyNubs.com. Then you can sit back and have yourself a cold one, whatever you have in it. Because you've earned it, my friend. <laughs>